right. Okay. Actually, I gotta do this before I can share. Too many screens. Okay. And here we go. Can you all see the presentation? Head nod, yes, no. Okay, great. So welcome to Voter Awareness 101. Actually, I'm gonna move y'all's pictures so I can see everything. Sorry. I gotta move your faces. Um, so welcome to Voter Awareness 101. Um, first, to get started, what we're going to talk about, why we're here. Um, we're here because your voice matters. Um, voting is how we um, make changes within our legislative system. It's how we make changes within our school board, within our local government, within our federal system. Um, voting is so important. Um, your vote matters. Um, it's best you have to it's a way to take action it's a way to get involved it's a way to be civically engaged within our society so tonight we're going to discuss um just washington elections in general oh i had my little picture show up okay uh washington elections in general who can vote how to register to vote how to cast your vote where you vote how to vote and return your ballot and then we're gonna introduce our voter registration challenge that we are gonna be planning. So in the state of Washington, our elections are decided um, by law, the second Tuesday of February, fourth Tuesday in April, first Tuesday in August, and then the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November. In February and April, um, those elections are considered special elections. Those are elections that are used by local governments, like school boards, fire districts, city councils, uh, county commissions. And a lot of times you'll see that when, um, say, the school board wants to propose a new levy or fire district needs um, to, or like they want to raise taxes or um, other local government issues. Um, local governments can also choose to use the August or November elections to pose those questions as well. And I will say, if we have any questions, um, please feel free to like put them in the chat and then I'm keeping an eye on Molly and they can let me know when, um, if there's any questions in between. So feel free to chime in. This is, um, I want everybody to just feel free to join. August and November elections are um, candidates for public office that are selected. Um, They're usually the primary and general elections. So um, August elections is called the primary. In our state, we eliminate all but the two most popular candidates when um, there are two or more candidates vying for an, off vying for an office. Um, in Washington, all public offices, except the US president and the two candidates who received the most votes, um, advance to the November elections. So for example, we could potentially have, say, two Republicans or two Democrats could advance to the general election after the August primary. Our general elections, which most people are familiar with, is the November election. Um, this is gonna select the final winner for whatever office um, a candidate is running for. In even numbered years, um, voters select count candidates for county offices and state legislatures and Congress. Um, typically what you'll find on your ballot is going to be your, um, so on the, even on the four years, every four years, you'll have a presidential state executive offices, which includes the governor, attorney general, and the secretary of state. On odd number years, it's your city and town offices and other local governments, also school boards as well. Um, odd number year races, the two or few candidates will not appear on the primary. So that's sometimes where you might come November and you're like, I don't remember this person being on, you know, the primary ballot, that's why. In even numbered years, county offices, state legislatures and Congress is who you'll see on your ballot. And within even numbered years, races with two or few candidates will be on the primary, even though they're most certain to advance to the November election anyway. Sorry, every time I move your faces. 
Um, you'll also find that there are ballot measures and um, ballot measures or initiatives and referenda, which are um, basically laws that are created by the people. Um, any registered voter can propose an initiative to create a new state law or a change in existing state law. Um, initiatives to the people are proposed to laws that they just submit directly to the voters. Referenda is the power of voters to approve or reject laws that are passed by the legislature. Um, I think too, we have an example and I'll put that in our toolkit later, just to get an idea so you can see. I know a lot of times um, folks, they're very confusing and hard to understand, but I think if you know what the what an initiative is and what a referendum is, it's, it's helpful to be able to make a decision on whether you should reject or approve a certain ballot initiative or a referendum. So um, initiatives to the people are proposed laws that are submitted directly to the voters. Initiatives that are go to the legislature are proposed laws submitted directly to the legislature. Before an initiative to the people or an initiative to the legislature can appear on a ballot, you have to, the sponsor has to collect 324,516 signatures of registered voters. Um, so I'm sure if you've been in Washington for a long time, you are quite familiar with Tim Iman, who does initiatives all the time. Or you have had the experience of coming out of a grocery store or a Target or somewhere and somebody stops you and say, hey, will you sign this? This is what they're asking you to sign. They are trying to get a specific law on the ballot. Uh, referendums are um, proposed laws the legislature has referred to voters. So sometimes the legislature will pass a law. And um, what happens is, is that it can be, you can have voters can I make a decision on whether to accept or reject it? Um, laws that are passed by the legislature, voters have, voters have petitioned be referred to the ballot is basically what it all is. Um, again, any registered voter may petition that a law proposed by the legislature be referred to the voters before taking effect. Referendums are a little different. You need less signatures. So referendums, you only need 162,258 signatures of registered voters. That ends up taking us, did I skip one? Yeah, okay. So who can register to vote is the big question. You gotta be a US citizen, at least 18 years of age by election day, a Washington state resident for more than 30 days by election day, or, and finished prison sentences from felony convictions. Oh gosh, this keeps going back, sorry, it's a new program. I gotta move your faces again. All right, guys. There we go. So what that means is someone you need to be either born here in the United States or became a natural a citizen through naturalization, um, a permanent resident in Washington State, and then you can register. Uh, teenagers can register to vote at 16 or 17, but they cannot vote until 18. Um, and then you can basically register as long as you're not in total confinement, which would mean that you are no longer in prison. So the moment that you are released, you are eligible to register to vote. Um, I will say 17 year olds can vote in the August primary if they will be 18 by the November election. And we'll talk about that in just a second, a little bit more. And Chanel, we do have a question in the chat. Sure. Um, from Blair, what determines how many registered voters signatures are required for a referendum or an initiative? That's actually uh, determined by state law. I don't have the statute off the top of my head, but I can find it for you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so future, we have a future voter program. Effective July of 2019, um, 16 and 17 year olds can register to vote in advance of their 18th birthday when they're um, obtaining their driver's license or through um, a new program that they have in schools called the Temperance and Good Citizen Day, which is held in January. Um, motor voter registration uh, basically requires that DOL ask 16 and 17 year olds certain specific questions to help them register to vote when they go and obtain their driver's license. Um, a little fun fact, I testified on the initial bill in 2014 was the first time that this legislation was proposed. 
as a student lobbyist when I was a lobbyist for my college, Evergreen College. Evergreen State College. Um, it didn't pass then, as you can see, because it took all the way five years later to get um, it approved. But you'd be surprised that we had a lot of legislators who were against letting 16 and 17 year olds even register to vote. Also, another issue was that um, at the time, our auditors computer systems that we used, um, each basically, we they used three different systems, and they couldn't talk to each other. So it was like, Western Washington used one system, Central Washington used another, and then Eastern Washington used another system. And they didn't have the ability to communicate with each other. And so there was a lot of worry of like, what somebody moves, what do we do? How do we, you know, how do we do that? Good Temperance and Citizen Days, something that started in 2020. Um, so each year on January 16th or the preceding Friday, if that happens to fall on a non-school day, social studies and history teachers um, must allow students to register to vote in their history or social studies classes. Um, it is very important that students register to vote and that um, you catch people, young folks, early on. Because I think too, once you get registered to vote, it just becomes natural. The earlier you do it, the more natural it becomes. And also back then um, at the time, I believe it was only like 24% of 18 to 25 year olds were actually even registered to vote. Um, that number has significantly gone up now that folks are able to register once they get their driver's license or within school. We also recently um, passed a new law that allows those that are coming out of incarceration to immediately regain their right to vote. Um, previously, you had to be off of community custody or in other words, probation to be um, eligible to register to vote. Um, House Bill 1078 was um, something that a lot of folks have been trying to get passed for so long. Um, and you know, it's unfair that folks are, you know, out of prison, no longer in confinement, and are out in the community, are affected by the laws and the rules and regulations and things that are created, but yet they couldn't vote on it, even just because they say they were on maybe probation for two or maybe five years. I mean, we've had instances I've seen where people were on probation for 10 years. And so that means like, even though you're not in prison, you still have no say in what goes on around you and your society for 10 years. And that just really isn't, it's not equitable, it's not fair. So um, that bill was passed last year and then it went into effect January of 2022. So that's something really important. And previously, a lot of, um, the, the, lot of the problem with getting the word out is that when the legislation was passed back in 2010 to allow people, um, off of community custody to vote, there was no money put, there was no fiscal note on the bill, no money put towards educating the public about the bill. I actually spent a whole summer um, educating folks about it, you know, the new law and getting formerly incarcerated people registered to vote. That was in 2013, actually. So again, effective January, you walk out the gates, you are immediately eligible to vote immediately eligible to register to vote. So two, sometimes I, we would get questions like when we we're trying to register voters of, you know, what if I have a misdemeanor? Can I still vote? That's fine. Misdemeanors do not affect your voting rights. Um, matter of fact, folks can even vote in jail. And there actually is a, a campaign going on right now in Pierce County where they're trying to get uh, ballots available to those that are in the Pierce County jail. If you have a juvenile record, you can still vote, register to vote. Um, if you still owe LFOs, which are legal financial obligations, also known as court fines and fees, you are eligible to register to vote. If you do not have an address, a physical address, you are eligible to register to vote. All folks need to do is use an identifiable location, usually cross streets or a landmark, and then you set the mailing address as general delivery at a post office. Each year, there's a deadline. We are um, really fortunate in Washington to have online registration. Not everybody has that. And we actually were one of the, we were one of the leaders in the country to get online registration. Um, I actually did also testify on a bill back in 2014 to consolidate our voter registration dates. 
Um, it used to be a little bit wonkier than this. It's gotten better. Um, so now you can basically register online for the primary up until July 25th. Then on August 2nd, um, you can register to vote in person at an auditor's office up until like 8 p.m. of election day and register and cast your ballot up until 8 p.m. on the day of the election. So that would be August 2nd or in this, the general case, it would be November 3rd. So even if you run into somebody or you meet someone who has not registered to vote and say it's November 1st, they still could physically go to a auditor's office and fill out a, a red voter registration form and submit that and be eligible to vote in the November 8th election. Um, where do we vote? So Washington has 49 legislative districts and 10 congressional districts. Um, your legislative districts are the districts that are represented by your state legislators. So that would be your state representative or your state senator. Congressional districts are gonna be your um, people that are in Congress, federal, federal candidates. That's gonna, you have a representative and then we have two state senators. And then congressional um, districts, actually, well, not our congressional districts, but our legislative districts just really went through some changes and we'll also talk about that. Um, your district is determined by your address. And every 10 years, we update our legislative districts to make sure that um, each district is represented by a equal number of residents. And that process is called redistricting. And what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna show you a little short, oh, no, 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 short video <laughs> before, short video on redistricting. And it explains that process a little bit. It's kind of it's a little cute. And I think the redistricting committee did a good job. So I'm gonna let this play. And then as soon as it's done, I'll get right back to the presentation. It's that time again, when states redraw their congressional and state legislative district boundaries using census data. These new maps will rebalance shifts in population that have occurred over the last 10 years to ensure equal representation across the state. This process is known as redistricting. States across the nation handle redistricting in different ways. In Washington, our constitution establishes an independent bipartisan redistricting commission. The Washington State Redistricting Commission is made up of four voting members chosen by the four caucuses in the state legislature. In other words, the House and Senate Republicans each appoint a member to the commission, and the same for the House and Senate Democrats. These four voting members choose a non-voting, non-partisan fifth member to chair the commission meetings. Voting members are charged with drawing draft maps, and our chair is charged with stewarding the commission through a process that will yield final maps approved by at least three voting members. The commission must submit its final redistricting plan to the legislature by November 15th. If the legislature agrees with the plan, it will become law 30 days into the 2022 legislative session. If the legislature wishes to amend the submitted plan, amendments require a two-thirds majority vote in both chambers. The 2021 redistricting cycle is different from past cycles because the data needed to draw new lines, which comes from the Census Bureau, has been delayed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Ordinarily, data would have been available in April, this year, data won't be available for the commission to use until mid to late August. Until then, the commission is prioritizing input from the public. This is your opportunity to tell us about your community and weigh in on existing congressional and legislative district boundaries and what you think your district maps ought to look like. We want to ask you to help us draw your WA. If you visit our website at redistricting.wa.gov, you'll find information on when our public meetings will be held, how to find your current congressional and legislative district, and how to submit comments to the commission, including how to request translation services. You will also be able to use a mapping tool to draw your community of interest or to comment on the current boundaries or plans submitted by others. You'll be able to quite literally draw your raw. We hope you will take some time to learn about the redistricting process, submit your comments to the redistricting commission, and draw your raw. So that video actually was from last year. The districts have actually already been redrawn, but I wanted to show it because it just gave a quick little, um, little recap of what actually redistricting is. So this year, um, 
If you want to find out your district, it's best to go to the redistricting website, which we have provided, will provide you within the toolkit. For elections 2023 and beyond, you can go to the Washington State Legislature's page and find your district by just putting inputting your address and it'll give you your legislative district and congressional district as well. Um, for example, I wanna show folks, so I'm just gonna switch, stop sharing real quick on this, and then we're gonna share, I'm gonna show you the map so folks can get an idea of what it looks like and how to go about doing that. So if you wanted to find your district, you're gonna to go to the redistricting website and then this map will come up. So let's see right now, and over here is where you can add layers. And so you can check to see, you can add your congressional legislative district. Can y'all see all this? Actually, let me make that bigger. You can add your congressional district and then we'll do legislative as well. So you can see it. Um, we're going to leave the county boundaries. So just for example, I'll put in, um, let's put it in bail funds address. There we go. So that will take you to our, where our mailing address is. And so then zoom to there zoom in and then you'll be able to find out that our office sits in the 43rd legislative district and we are in the seventh congressional district so this tool is really handy because um, if you go to the legislature's website right now it has not been updated with the new redistricting uh the new districts um it'll still give you an old district so for this year, I suggest if people don't know their legislative district to go to the redistricting website, which is just redistricting.wa.gov and use this interactive map and put your address and then you'll find the precise and correct legislative and congressional districts. Okay, back to the presentation. Any questions before I go back in to the presentation? So now back to our show. Sorry, all technical difficulties. Okay. So what are some of the things that are different about in voting in Washington is one, we vote by mail. A lot of folks in other states, which I'm sure you've seen if you've ever watched the news or watched TV that um, they vote in person. Um, here, our ballots are mailed to us 18 days before each election and that should give you enough time to get your ballot back in. Um, we also have online voter registration, like I mentioned before where we allow folks to register to vote and update their address on votewa.gov. Um, we have a top two primary, meaning the top two candidates with the most votes in the primary advance to the general, regardless of parties. We also have no party affiliation. Voters don't have to register um, a party to, uh, to vote. Like you can vote, if you wanna vote for somebody as a Republican, you can vote as a Democrat, you can cross, cross party vote. Our state also does something different is where we issue a voter's pamphlet. Um, it's a statewide voter's pamphlet. It's mailed to every household. It typically will give you a, um, a picture of the candidate if they submitted their picture in on time to the Secretary of State, a brief a bio um, of the candidate, like their educational history, and then kind of their little stump speech that they, they, they give out. Um, it's very, very helpful, very, very useful. And if you so happen to not get a pamphlet, you can always find it online at the Secretary of State's website. Lastly, um, something that we do that a lot of folks don't is we have same day registration. You can, folks can always register on the same day election and vote before 8 p.m. on election day. So, um, you know, unlike other states, like if you forget, 
say it's like, you know, five o'clock, like, oh, I just got to work. I know I got to go vote. I forgot. You can at least go and register and cast your ballot right then and there. So once you do have a ballot, what do you do? So what you're going to do is you're going to get your ballot. It's going to come in a little envelope since we vote by mail. There'll be, um, there's actually two envelopes. You have uh, your ballot and then there's a secrecy envelope. And then there's the actual envelope that you will return your ballot in. So you're going to vote your ballot and then you're going to resign the return envelope. Um, you can mail your ballot in, no longer need postage. That's also something I testified for in, legis uh, in the legislature because we used to charge folks to mail their ballot, which can be a hindrance and or a burden for some folks, but we no longer do. So you can stick it in the mailbox. Um, it just has to be postmarked by election day, or you can return your ballot in an official ballot drop box until 8 p.m. on election day. Um, most drop boxes are located at um, fire stations, fire department stations. Um, some other places, some other counties have other places, but most of the time you should be able to find a ballot box at your fire station. After that, you can chat, track the status of your ballot to see if there was any issues with it um, on votewa.org. If your ballot so happens to be missing a signature or your signature does not match the signature that's on file, the elections office will call you um, before they process your ballot. So it's very important to make sure that you list your phone number or email address on that outside um, return envelope. There's a little space underneath your signature um, where you would put in either your phone number or your email address. That basically concludes our voter registration um, awareness and just information. Um, our, our next thing that we're kind of going to do is we wanted to do a voter registration challenge. We are challenging our volunteers to register three voters by the November general election. There will be a prize awarded to each volunteer who registers three voters. There'll be a special prize for those and the volunteer with the most registered voters for the primary. Another special prize for um, award, awarded for the most registered voters for the general election. And then we'll also have another prize for somebody that registers the most over both the primary and the general. How do you do that, you ask? We will get there. Um, but some things I just want folks to remember is the last day to register, these registration dates, and then also when um, registering folks to vote, if you do happen to use a paper registration, the forms have to be returned to the election, elections office eight days prior to election day and no later than five business days after it's completed. So go by the date that the person lists on the signature line. Paper forms that are submitted after the eighth day the eight day deadline will take effect for the next election. So if you miss that deadline, say for the primary, then what'll happen is they will be eligible to vote for the November general. But if you miss that deadline for the November general, they won't be eligible or take effect until either that February, April, if it's in one of those odd years or not again until August, if it's one of those even years. So how do you join the challenge? One, you're going to access the voter online, the online voter registration toolkit that we've created for you. There's lots of helpful documents and information in there, um, basically summarizing a lot of what I just said in here and answering a lot of questions. There is a QR code as well within there that you can have save on your phone and folks can scan that and it'll take them right to the voter registration uh, website and then they can register right there. Also within the toolkit are paper registration forms and a link to voter registration forms and 23 different languages. That's another thing that we're really good at here in Washington is that we provide voter registration forms in 23 different languages. Not a lot of states do that. Once you're done and you've registered a voter, you'll go to our online reporting system and you're gonna submit your voters initials because we don't want to keep track of who's registered to vote or um, make anyone feel uncomfortable. All we're asking you to do is just submit your name, email, how we can contact you to send you a prize and the initials of the folks that you registered to vote. And this is just so that we can track the number of how many folks you've registered. That 
concludes the presentation on the voter awareness went a lot faster than I thought. I'd love to open this up for questions or just a general discussion on um, voting or you know anything that y'all want to talk about. I am very, um, a lot of you who've been here before know I'm policy and legislation is my thing. I love it. Um, I love encouraging people to vote. I love encouraging people to get involved and learning this process. I think um, the more, the more you know, the better then the better off we will be. Um, being an informed voter is very important. Um, also within your toolkit, uh, we have given you a fact checkers guidelines and it lists different websites you can go to if you ever want to, you know, fact check some things or fact check people or fact check, you know, statements that you may have heard. Very helpful tool to use. And I also encourage you to share that with folks in your communities and people at your dinner tables and whoever you come across that might need some um, correction for their misinformation. Thank you, Molly, for sharing the toolkit. Yeah, definitely. Anyone, please jump in. Yeah, I went really fast, sorry. I, so I, it may have just not. It just shows how deeply you understand your material and how quickly you can get through it. Um, so my question isn't for me, but we do have out of, stout, out of state people in the room tonight. So does the voter um, registration challenge work across states? The dates will be different, I assume, but. Yeah, they'd be different, I assume. So I think probably the best thing would be general election to do the entire, because it's all going to be the same for, for the general election. Everybody's going to have that November 8th general election date. Primary is a little different. It's a little harder because everybody's primaries are different. But that the general will probably, if you're out of state, focus on that general election. Um, other thing is, is like part of the reason why I wanted to inform folks about the motor voter registering 16 and 17 year olds to vote is because those are going to be the easiest people to get to register because they may not have done it in January, just with COVID and, you know, online schooling and everything. And then also as well as kids that are 17, if they are 17, they can vote, but they'll be 18 by the time the November election comes, they can vote in this August primary. So get them registered. We need young, more different thinking minds as registered voters. If you want our country to not continue to go in the direction it is going. Uh, folks who don't feel represented by their government. Yes, I do. So um, if you don't like what's going on within your system, you have to have a voice to change it. I totally get it. I There are many, many folks in the Black community who believe, what's the point of voting? Why my vote doesn't count? Da, 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 da. But I think what you need to do is tell people to not think about it on the presidential or federal level. Think about it on a local level. Do you not like how your family members, friends, people in your community are being charged with you know all these crimes? Vote for the prosecutor. Vote a, prosecu a progressive prosecutor that in that you like. Do you not like the sentences that a judge is giving out? Are they not following the sentencing guidelines? Or you know, are they doing this? You got to vote. Are you tired of you know certain communities um, having to have IEPs within schools or the policy around IEPs in school districts? You need to vote for your school board members. Do you not like what's happening within your city, within the potholes, or you know, within your county, or your roads not being repaired? Vote for your city, your county council. I think the best way to combat that my voice vote doesn't matter is focus on the local elections because that's what's really, it's so important. Yes, federal elections are important. And, you know, with us all have, you know, with us having an electoral college, it kind of can sometimes make people feel like oh, this doesn't matter. But at home, it so matters. Um, and if you, want to see change, you have to, you have to vote. So if you don't participate, 
then how are you going to change anything? Also, I would tell people, you know, this goes back to the legislative advocacy, contact your legislator, meet them. Um, also go to, they're doing a lot of candidate forums going on right now. Go to a candidate forum. Some of them are held online. A lot of um, legislators will do, or candidates will do a teletown hall where they kind of do this town hall style forum and they do it online or they do it by phone. Those are really great to find out who people are and then ask them your questions, you know, um, ask folks how they feel about bail. Do they think cash bail should exist? You know, I mean, it's, it really is just about at home. And I, I, I know folks are very discouraged and um, worn out or feeling hopeless about our current federal government, but you can make so much change right at home. Politics is local, everything, it starts locally. So I think the best way to combat that would be telling folks, you know, telling them about the changes that they could see immediately. A whole nother thing is tell them to do a, an initiative. We're the people, we can, we can create any law we want. If you wanna create a, any registered voter can file an initiative, I mean, you know, can sponsor an initiative. You can do it. That's how we got marijuana passed here. Wasn't the legislature, it was the people. I think that's the only example, best example I know that was so like, oh, it was really happened is the marijuana law. I mean, marijuana became legal for recreational use here because of the citizens, not because of our legislature. Our legislature just wasn't gonna do it. So the people took it into their own hands and they did it. Um, there's a few other initiatives going on right now too here, like ending the, I mean, that's like a, ending the drug war. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Um, other ones I'm sure you've heard of is the $30 car tabs, you know, um, there's tons or one that recently last election didn't pass. It was, um, it's going to be a small tax on, I forgot what it was. It was like telephones or something. It was something very odd to fund mental health care. Didn't pass. But I also think if people saw the word tax and just, you know, freaked out, but that goes back into that voter's pamphlet or going to the Secretary of State's website and actually reading what the initiative or ballot measure is talking about. Um, sometimes we, you know, shoot our own selves in the foot because we vote uninformed and um, we end up with prosecutors or sheriffs that we really don't like, like in Pierce County. Um, so, the best thing to do is to be an informed voter and um, seek out information. I hope does that, I hope that helps answer, Amy. Um, Chanel, I also want to add that um, I have heard so many times from um, advocates and people who do a lot of um, legislative work that contacting your representatives does matter. <laughs> They listen and they do care. A lot of people think, oh, I'm gonna write a letter. And it's just gonna go in some pile and nobody's gonna read it. No, they do read it and they do listen. So. And I would encourage folks, if you have the capacity, write a handwritten letter. It's, odd, it's more meaningful. They really take that into consideration. Um, there is a link on the um, legislative website where you can submit you know, comments or questions to your legislator. But if you just, you can Google their name or if they are a Dem or they're a Republican, you can go to the, the Washington Dems webpage and it'll link you straight to their email address and you can contact them that way. But finding out their address, getting their legislative office address and handwriting a letter makes such a big difference. They literally do have one person that is all they do is um, constituent correspondence. They, they respond to the correspondence, they overlook it. They, and usually typically what happens with that is that say you send a letter in, it'll come in, the legislative assistant will you know, review the correspondence and then they will assign it to another staff member who pretty much works on that issue. But it does, it is so important. Like, and I, I truly believe that right now, like some of the reasons why we're in the situations we're in is because like the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So the folks that are talking the most are the ones that are getting everything done. So if we don't, you know, going back to what Amy said, we don't participate or we don't say anything, 
then what we want gets overlooked. And right now we have a lot of folks with more access and more voice to, you know, get, get their, you know, agenda passed. Um, I, the one good thing about COVID though has made our legislative process a lot more equitable and fair that people can actually, rather than having to go to Olympia to, you know, to testify or to speak to your legislator, you can, you know, go in on Zoom. Um, so I, I, those are, I mean, it's the best way to just, to make change. And I, I get frustrated too, even though like <laughs> Heidi, Molly and Becky can all attest to my morning rants about something that happened and I'm upset and um, I'm, I'm like, I'm giving up, I'm burnt out, I'm not doing this anymore. But in the end, I know I can't because there's a whole world and a whole, there's, I got a 12 year old who, I can't leave this world to her like this. And so we have to continue to make changes. And I think too is countering um, folks' misinformation, propaganda in our, you know, in our, our industry is the best thing that we can do. Um, you know, and, and talking to the media, like media right now is kind of like also the reason why we're in a lot of stuff. They're only voicing one side of an issue, you know? And so um, making those connections for us as advocates to sources of media is also another good thing. Anything else? Yeah, that was, sorry, y'all. I mean, I didn't think I was going to go that fast. <laughs> it seems like a lot of people pay more of their internet than just the population. Oh, wait, I can't hear you. Am I the only one having sound? Okay. Here. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, is just the population size what goes into redistricting? I feel like it more goes into it than just that. Or maybe I'm mistaken or it depends on the state uh, it is it's popular it's the size population size because it has to be even numbered um with who's in the district so it's like so that so like for example i think y'all got redistricted didn't you somebody told me mm -hmm. that. yeah so what happened basically is whatever district you were in before a lot of people moved in there and it was too many people so they had to take some of those folks out and even it out and put them into another district it really is population size. It's just got to be fair. Got it. Um, the toolkit, though, has a wellspring of information, and it covers almost probably any question you could have. Like, if somebody has new that moves into the state, you know, all those things, like, you know, the the deadlines, how to register, everything, the misinformation fact checkers. Um, maps to your legislative districts, the um, a links to the, the redistricting map, um, but also too, if you have any questions, please feel free to email myself or Molly and we will do the best that we can to get those questions answered. Ah, actually we do. So if you, we do, question was, do we ever kick folks off of our voting rolls? If you go without voting in two election cycles, they will remove you from the voter rolls. Thank you, I forgot to say that. Um, so it's important to make sure you vote in those election cycles. And it's really though the, I don't think they do it though, if you don't vote in the special elections, those don't count. It's gotta be two regular elections, cycles. Which is like eight years, right? So it's, yeah. yeah, it takes a minute. Um, and even sometimes they're, I mean, I'll say this, it's gotten better, but even at that, I they they weren't on top of it. Our system has gotten been updated and improved, but before the archaic one didn't always catch folks. Okay. I mean, we're nowhere near like Florida. So okay. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm trying to think about who to register. I feel like everyone I know is probably registered. Like, I mean, young, young people for sure, right? Like new voters, but yeah, I think young people for sure. Um, but also too. Sometimes there's a lot of people you think are registered or not. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just come those conversations. If you start talking like, hey, are you registered to vote? Mm -hmm. Just ask. I mean, you know, you're not asking anybody's party affiliation. You're just, just seeing if you're registered to vote. Um, but I'm going to tell you, like the easiest folks are going to be the young, the young people um, or college students that are, you know, like not originally from here. 
they are, you know, here going to UW, Seattle U or something like that, that might also be another good person to try to register. Um, other folks that you meet in the community, people that you may encounter that are formerly incarcerated. There are so many formerly incarcerated people that do not know their right to vote is restored. There are also a lot of people that are um, housing insecure that don't know that they can vote. They think you have to have a physical address, you know, a, a house, a structure, brick and mortar to be able to register to vote. And you don't, all you need is a cross street. I mean, if your tent is on, you know, 10th and J, that's where you write. And that we do, we make it very inclusive here um, in comparison to a lot of other states, you know, we don't have to, you don't have to show an ID. You know, we don't have any, you know, voter ID laws here. We don't have any, um, what's another weird one? You know, or just having to wait in line, you know, hours on end, you know, to vote. I remember as a kid, you know, we had that. I remember at school, cause my school used to host, um, be a voting polling place and, you know, seeing all the adults. Go. But that right there, it just, that improves right there. That improves our system. We really could make change here. You know, it's so easy. It's a piece of paper, fill it out, chuck it in the box. That's it. I had another question, Chanel. Yeah. Do you recommend, um, this is like different from registration, but do you recommend a voting guide? Like I, tip, I, I last year I used, I looked at Fuse. Yeah, um, so there's the Progressive Voters Guide. You know what, what I'll do is we'll get that sent out in like the next biweekly updates or like an all volunteer, try to get that sent out. Um, I've been, okay, so me too. I used Fuse before mm -hmm. um, and I will say like last year, I was trying to find one that I liked the best of yet to find one. But most of the time what I'll do is either Fuse or the Pro Progressive Voters Guide for folks that are progressive. Oh, those are, oh, that. that's not the Fuse one. That's another one. I think okay. Fuse actually links to that, to be okay. quite honest. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, I, I think though, there, I know there's a, there's, I believe there's another one that's kind of even better and goes deeper. deeper. Okay. Um, but I got to find it or either it stopped, they stopped doing it. Cause there was another one that I used to use that used to have everything. Um, all the way, you know, from the candidate down to the ballot measure to the initiative, and it will break it down very plain English. And mm -hmm. I went to look for it last cycle and I couldn't find it. So I don't know if they, you know, COVID is <sighs> like so many things have like disappeared or gone or just don't, don't exist anymore. But I will get on that and make sure that at least y'all have it before the general for sure. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, let me write that down. Any other questions, even not voting related or just anything, bail, the media, what are our responses? <laughs> yeah, does anyone have any questions about the challenge specifically too? Oh yeah. Or any thoughts on who you might? Oh, thanks, Peter. That's good to Thank know. Thank you. Um, I will say though, too, if there is an organization that you you believe in, you follow, you agree with their mission. Most, a lot of the ones that have a an advocacy arm, a part of their organization, will either have their have a guide or have a link to another guide. So that's also just another good place to look for them. Any organization like Statewide Poverty Action Network does one, um, Fuse does one, and then um, I can't remember the other people, the one that I was looking for last year, but those are a couple of other organizations that will do it. Although I think too, like the League of Women Voters sometimes does one. Um, Amy asked if we could give a refresher on the challenge. Yeah, so um, challenge is basically just um, register three, at least three people to vote by the general, by November, by the general election, November. You will get, um, we'll, we'll award a prize for whoever registers the most during the primary. 
most during the general and then overall. And then everyone who registers three people will also get a prize. So it's a special prize, a way to get two prizes in a sense. And um, the QR code, matter of fact, let's see if I can, it's really, it, I just made a QR code and it will, folks can scan it and that'll take you directly to the online, um, the secretary vote was uh, website and you can register to vote. You can check your address on there. Um, yeah, you can see also, it'll tell you like when you voted, when you last voted, it's got like all kind of like your little voting history on there as well. And then um, the toolkit also will have paper, like I said, paper forms in there if for folks that um, need to do a paper form. And yeah, it's pretty simple. We don't want to make it too hard for you. Will that link work for people out of state? It go well, it will, but it'll go to our Secretary of State. It goes directly to our Washington's voter registration um, website. So unfortunately, no, but what state are you in? And I can find it and I can make one. It's easy. I'm in Minnesota. Gotcha. I will get it. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's easy to do. Gotcha. I'll get that done today. Anyone else? Wow, breeze through it. Um, oh, I guess I will just update y'all for some of you guys that participated in our 60 day court camp, I mean, court watch campaign. Um, we will be releasing the final report for the campaign, the court watch, and you know, highlighting the data and information that we found, um, what specific trends we were able to see. And hopefully, I hope to get that out in the next couple of weeks. We're